Hello and welcome to episode 47 of Radicals in Conversation, the monthly podcast from Pluto Press, one of the world's leading independent radical publishers. I'm your host, Chris Brown. The trade union movement in Britain has existed for nearly two centuries, from the Tollpuddle Martyrs to the 1888 Match Girls Strike to the militant action of women machinists at the Ford plant in Dagenham in 1968. Organised labour has a rich, if complicated, history. But in the ebb and flow of workers' power over the decades, we find ourselves at a historic low point. Union membership is declining, with young workers in particular less likely to be part of a trade union than ever. In every year since 1991, the number of strikes has been lower than in any year prior to that point. Much of this decline can be laid at the door of successive rafts of anti-union legislation brought in by Thatcher and more recently by David Cameron, raising the legal bar for strike ballots and outlawing secondary action. But as our guests today argue, reports of the trade union movement's death have been greatly exaggerated. Not only is the need for unions more urgent than ever as we face our second winter of the pandemic, but workers are taking action across the economy and winning, and it's women, young people and migrant workers who are leading the charge. It's my great pleasure, therefore, to be joined on the panel today by Eve Livingston, author of Make Bosses Pay, Why We Need Unions, Jane Hardy, author of Nothing to Lose But Our Chains, Work and Resistance in 21st Century Britain, and Henry Chango Lopez, General Secretary of the Independent Workers' Union of Great Britain, or IWGB. Before we get underway, as usual, podcast listeners can get 50% off both books through plutobooks.com. Just use the coupon podcast at the checkout. If you're listening to this between the 1st and the 15th of November 2021, then you're also in luck because Pluto is actually running our early holiday sale. And you can get 50% off all of our published books, including Make Bosses Pay and Nothing to Lose But Our Chains. So do check that out. Lastly, a quick shout out to Julius Meltzer, who's our newest Patreon patron. So a big thank you to you, Julius, for your support. Okay, without further ado, this is Eve Livingston, Jane Hardy and Henry Chango Lopez on Radicals in Conversation. Thanks, first of all, to you, Eve, Jane and Henry for being here. It's really exciting to get to have this discussion. Yeah, Pluto's published two new books of note, Make Bosses Pay by Eve Livingston and Nothing to Lose But Our Chains by Jane Hardy. So it's fantastic that both of you are here today and also to be here with Henry Chango Lopez, who is features in both books through his role in the IWGB. So Eve, I thought I'd start by asking you a question. Leaving aside the fact that Make Bosses Pay is part of Pluto's Outspoken series, which is, I suppose, designed to be accessible to younger readers, what would you say is kind of valuable or instructive about a focus on younger workers when approaching a subject about labour power and trade unions more broadly? Yeah, thank you, Chris. So, yeah, I suppose the kind of focus on young workers felt quite obvious to me, even aside from the sort of outspoken um, focus, just because I think the way that we talk about unions a lot in, in the UK context is this sort of moment of existential crisis and you know are they going to survive their memberships dwindling their powers also also dwindling I suppose and to me you know young workers are going to be the key to that just in a very kind of practical logistical sense because they are the kind of next generation of workers and can be the next generation of trade unionists who go on to kind of make the movement uh, work better for them change the movement and keep it going and, and build it for generations to come so I felt like that was that was important in a very practical sense. And I also felt like the kind of existential questions that people ask about unions and young workers often write those young workers off as being apolitical or apathetic to their situations. So, you know, it's like, why why aren't young workers in unions? Do they just not care sort of thing? And that is not my kind of experience or what I see people, you know, younger than myself doing or saying, because we see young people um, every day getting involved in you know climate strikes and in unions of different kinds so tenants unions and community unions which have grown in power and in numbers compared to trade unions so to me young people are kind of seeing a problem in society they've recognized that the life they're living is unfair and that the structures are unequal but they at the moment they're turning to these other kinds of 
also very valid solutions and it's not necessarily trade unions that they're always turning to so I wanted to write something that put trade unions back in that conversation for young people and said you know those other things are also answers but here's a huge part of the solution that you can kind of embrace and build into something that works for you. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll talk some more about these kind of community orientated unions as well, because there's some fascinating stuff there. Um, I suppose in the book, you talk about, well, on the one hand, some research that the TUC conducted at some point into the barriers to young workers union participation. And the most significant was, I think, that many of those questions in their survey didn't even know what a trade union was. And then conversely, you also kind of refer to this refrain that young people might express, which is, you know, oh, I joined my union if it was any good, but I can't think of anything they've done. So why do you think, firstly, there's this lack of awareness amongst young people? I mean, you've you've already pointed to the fact that young people are politicised. It's not a case of apathy. So wh- why do you think the TUC found this lack of awareness amongst young people about what unions are and do? You know, the book does not let unions off the hook for their own role in presenting themselves as a, a solution for young people. But I do think that um, the context that they operate within has a huge kind of part to answer for that. So, you know, just the, the kind of increasing attacks on union power and the way that they have to operate within these very tight constraints for any sort of industrial action nowadays, you know, it's not surprising that young people aren't seeing examples Um uh, there are some examples, but they're not seeing the same kind of number of, you know, large scale strike actions, for instance, or of unions kind of winning in an everyday sense as a sort of, um, you know, theme that's that's always there in, in the news or whatever. Um, so I think a lot of it is that kind of contextual stuff, which is what I tried to get at in the chapter that you alluded to, Chris, about, um, you know, your union is disempowered rather than being kind of rubbish or useless. So I think there's that. I, I think there's lots of other factors at play too. You know, I think the, the media have a a role to play in all of this and they don't often report on sort of labour movements as labour movements they often report in the UK at least as in relation to the Labour Party um, which I think is you know doing a great disservice to the the work that happens within unions so there's there's a lot going on there um, but I, I think it has to be about both holding unions to account for the things that they could be doing much better while also recognising that they operate in a very difficult kind of hostile set of circumstances. Hmm. One thing that came through reading Jane's book is it's actually not a pessimistic look at the role of unions and the history of unions. So maybe Jane, I'd be interested to hear a bit about the history of trade unions in this country, some of these contextual difficulties that they find themselves in now in terms of like legislation that's been passed and what the limits that have been placed on unions are. So um, yeah, Jane, if you want to go ahead. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, Firstly, to Eve, congratulations on your book. It's really fantastic and very much needed. And looking through it, we've actually talked about quite a few of the same disputes, quite a few of the same issues, although I think I tackle it in a a slightly different way. I guess what brought me to writing this book was four decades in the trade union movement, but also a kind of irritation Um, as Eve has mentioned, that trade unions are facing an existential crisis. And it is true and undeniable that the rate of strikes is at the lowest point ever. But strikes are a very poor, accurate measure of what's going on in the labour movement. For example, the action amongst teachers wouldn't have featured at all because it wasn't a strike. And I looked around me and I saw some really inspiring cases of workers and quite often the least likely workers, and Henry might talk about this, fighting back, winning and inspiring other workers. So I guess my book is in two halves. The first half is to really take on the arguments of um, some of the hand ringers, let's say, who've said, oh, we can't do anything in trade unions because capital is mobile, because all workers are precarious, because we've got creative workers and knowledge workers. And I systematically try to take on that through looking particularly at the British economy and saying that work has always been precarious. 
this idea, for example, in Guy Standing's book, The Precariat, that everybody had these lovely standard contracts in the post-World War simply was not the case. If you were a migrant worker, a woman, if you worked in the building sector, if you were a docker, if you worked in the film industry, you did not have a standard contract. So I take on the idea of precarious work and that it's something new. Also, the idea that we have different sorts of workers, creative workers, knowledge workers, a lot of which can be laid at the door of Tony Blair for encouraging sort of this cool Britannia and saying that actually, whether you are a games developer, a Weetabix producer, uh, whether you research into pharmaceuticals, you are exploited and the conditions for fighting back always exist. The second half of the book is to really look at some of those inspiring disputes. The ones amongst women, the Birmingham care workers in Glasgow, the equal pay strike, migrant workers who, as Henry will tell us, have been at the centre of some really successful disputes. And also teachers and lecturers, quite often very young workers, who've been involved in action over the last two years. And really, I concur with Eve when I say that um, young people have been written out of the picture and young people have been organising and fighting back. And it is you know, not the case that they're not interested in trade unions. And therefore, I've got a whole chapter which is called um, There are no no-go areas for trade unions. Mm, yeah, thanks, Jane. Um, one other thing that you kind of definitely is a strand throughout your book is how migrant workers and, and women have also been at the forefront of union action throughout its history. In contrast to this, you know, the almost cartoonish kind of idea of what a member of the working class is, you know, a white male worker in a, in a sort of an industrial setting. I'd be interested just briefly to to take on some of the history, actually, of unions in Britain, how they developed, what they came up against. And then I would like to talk about, yeah, the characteristics of the economy today and how you know there's all this great work going on organising different sectors of that economy. It's quite hard to give a potted history of the trade union movement in Britain. But I guess what we have seen is there has been a tendency towards mergers and the formation of really some giant unions. And I'm thinking of in the private sector and sometimes the public sector, we now have Unite and Unison, which have, I think, over a million members, or nearly a million at least. And we have the GNB, which I think has just under a million members. And of course, that produces strengths and weaknesses, which we might want to talk about. And then perhaps it might be interesting to ask Henry about another development over the last 10 or 20 years, which is new unions that have become frustrated with the mainstream and decided to form their own organisations. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Yeah, exactly. I think uh, we are a new kind of unions that have decided to organise, especially those workers who have been forgotten and marginalised by the big unions, but also by the government uh, in terms of their workers' rights and the situation that they have. So we have been making changes because uh, we have been organising those workers who at the moment are part of the the working class who are basically helping the, the country, especially you see like in the pandemic as well, like they're being at the forefront of the pandemic, those workers that have been forgotten are suddenly uh, seen as key workers. I mean, these workers have been key workers for a long time. We've been fighting these battles for for a long period of time since we started organizing. And I think uh, this has been because of the failure of the big unions to uh, organize these workers and leaving them on the side. So that, that's been our job to do that. And that's what we continue doing. Mm. Yeah, no, thanks, Henry. So could you tell us a little bit about the Independent Workers' Union of Great Britain or the IWGB, as people might know it? When was the union set up? And you've talked a little bit about why it was needed, but could you tell us a little bit about the story of its, yeah, genesis, its origins? Yeah, the IWGB was set up 
uh, around 2012 by uh, Latin American cleaners uh, who uh, decided to organize uh, because they tried to organize in the beginning, but it was very difficult, having no resources and having no support for their struggle. And uh, I am one of those workers who um, used to be part of the big union as well and, and left the union uh, because we were having the same issues. The reason the IWGB was set up was uh, to continue the fight in order to improve our conditions and also to create resources for ourselves in order to continue the struggle because um, the problems that we were facing at the time, it was very bad and still this continues. You know, work has been... Uh, treated badly, especially workers who work for outsourcing companies and uh, many workers like cleaners, security guards and other precarious workers that we represent. That's the reason I mean, the IWGB was set up and we continue organizing these workers and we've been successful uh, in doing so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's been some major successes in recent years, including some through the courts as well. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of these examples of the victories that the unions uh, won through organizing? Yeah, basically we have been fighting to improve the conditions of precarious workers, you know, precarious employment. And uh, since the union was set up, the union has gone on and organized many other workers that we never thought they were going to join the union, cleaners union. And now the union has become a big union where we have uh, 11 branches and uh, have gone on to organize foster carers, uh, couriers, minicab drivers, cycle instructors, charity workers, security guards, yoga, nannies and youthers, game workers. And uh, this is uh, something that is part of, of the change that is happening at the moment within the trade union movement and also within the employment situation that workers are in and the need that there is for a change. Since we have uh, been organizing, we have had a lot of successes in terms of fighting outsourcing successfully where we have been huge improvements in terms of uh, terms and conditions like sick pay, holiday and pensions, in terms of equality, like in universities, like University of London, we managed to end it doing outsourcing after 10 years of battle. And now all the cleaners, security guards, they are working directly for the University of London. We managed to do that at Goldsmiths. We uh, continue the campaign at UCL and uh, London Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, for instance, where workers are working now directly for the university. These are huge victories and a change uh, in life for many people. We also been fighting the gig economy, you know, in terms of couriers, in terms of minicab drivers, and we have had successes by fighting these uh, big companies that are denying workers uh, rights for these workers. But also, you know, we've been organizing foster carers as well, like you are across the country. And uh, despite there not being in one uh, workplace, we've been able to organize them across the country, which is a, a big achievement as well for us. And also, we have had very good successes in terms of litigation. We have taken cases against the government during the pandemic. We managed to secure, we managed to win a case against the government in terms of health and safety. And yeah, many other campaigns that we've been fighting, London Living Wage across London, have uh, also been successful. And we continue uh, organizing those workers because I think at the moment with the technology changing and with the gig economy taking over, it's affecting a lot of people and we need to keep the peace with that. I mean, uh, unfortunately, the workers' rights are not keeping peace with that, but we, I think, in terms of us fighting uh, to improve those conditions and to make sure that the workers are treated fairly and given the conditions they deserve is something that we are doing at the moment and we keep doing that. Mm, yeah, as you kind of mentioned, you've had loads of great success. I mean, I wonder what you would say if I was to ask, what is it that the IWGB is doing differently, perhaps, that is accounting for its success, particularly given some of the challenges that you've identified, you know, organising where there's not a single workplace, for instance. Tell us about the kind of work the union does when organising. What are some of the issues that you're taking action over? And I guess, crucially, what are the methods or the tactics that you're using to such great effect? One of the things we have done differently, uh, to give the workers the power that they need in order to fight for, to improve their conditions. And this is something that we do at the IWGB. The IWGB is a member-led union where members are the ones who are taking the decisions in terms of, uh, you know, taking direct action, in terms of going on strike, in terms of organizing workers. Uh, and, and I think that's been the success of the union. Like, making workers be part of the change, but also 
making them be part of their leadership, their decision making. Uh, we have all, all the workers in the union are part of the decision making of the whole union, but also in terms of the struggles that they are facing in their campaigns. And that has been very, very important because uh, they are the best people to take decisions in regards to their struggles. You know, we've been fighting outsourcing, we've been fighting the, the gig economy, try with the litigation against these uh, big corporations like Uber, like Deliveroo, and other, and other companies in the gig economy where we've been successful in getting uh, employment status for some of the workers and t- taking these employers to court as well. We also, you know, do direct action. We organize uh, demonstrations, uh, which will be allowed. We do um, strikes as well. And I think the most important thing as well has been to create the leaderships of tomorrow because that's something that we focus more in, in, in our union. We try to always develop new leaders who are going to be the leaders of tomorrow. And I think it's very important to have uh, the workers taking the decisions, but also giving them the tools and the learning experience that they need in order to continue their struggle. We focus a lot uh, in organizing and campaigns. And what we try to do is um, have a different strategy, but that involves uh, all the workers uh, who are facing uh, issues uh, in, in the sectors that we represent. It may be like post or, or cleaners or, or drivers or security or game workers. Recently, we launched uh, something that we call the School of Organizing, where we have uh, many officials from different branches learning and getting trained in order to fight the struggles of tomorrow in a, in a structured manner to create capacity in the union, but also in each of the branches that we represent. Mm. I suppose I'd ask then, like, if some of the dynamism of these kind of new unions is attributable to the small scale and political independence, what lessons can larger, more established mainstream unions learn from unions like the IWGB or the United Voices of the World um, in terms of their approach to organising strategies, in terms of their internal structures and so on? How much of this can be scaled up? I think you can see some of that in the mainstream unions, but it's maybe a bit more patchy. So, for example, the women in Birmingham who were carers who had their hours and contracts threatened by Birmingham Council, their success was because of very good local organisers who managed to find some space within the unison machinery And they did all of those things. They had strikes. They managed to get solidarity. They had demonstrations. They managed to keep those women on board for 18 months and 83 days of strike action and won. And I guess the sad thing is, why can't those sort of tactics be replicated? And why can't that success be shouted from the rooftops so that other workers are inspired to do the same. One other very quick example, the National Education Union is very interesting because it chimes with what Eve argued, which is that workers join unions, workers become active in unions when things are happening and when unions are doing something. And the NEU twice pushed the government back on unsafely opening schools during the COVID pandemic. And what happened was loads of new reps, mainly young, mainly women, came forward either to be health and safety reps or reps within schools. So there are those spaces in the big unions Some unions are better than others. I think the NEU has had an organising strategy that has been very successful. And that when they actually did something and were arguably the best union over COVID, then 20,000 extra people joined and at least 1,000 new reps came forward. Um, Yeah, I was actually going to make a couple of very similar points to those. Um, One being that, yeah, I kind of, um, I understand the narrative that's emerged about the the kind of old versus new or, you know, the grassroots versus the sort of institutionalised unions. And certainly I do think a lot of inspiring actions in recent years have come from some of those new kind of grassroots unions. 
But I was going to say similar to Jane that I think there are also examples which can be quite instructive in the larger, more institutionalized unions of where people have managed to navigate those structures and what is quite often quite a bureaucratic kind of long process to get anything done. Um, And the example that I would use, which also touches on something Jane just talked about um, in terms of new unionists, I think, are always going to be formed at the point of grievance. So there are always going to be some of us who will say, you know, I'm going to join the union no matter what it's just what you do it's part of my worldview and it's to do with principle but I think we have to be realistic that for the most part many of our members are going to arrive at the point at which they are facing a problem at work and I think what we have at the moment in a lot of cases is union models which deal with those in a very individualistic way so um I've kind of I think I describe it in the book as sort of firefighting or whack-a-mole um where that person comes to you with their individual grievance and you kind of might go into that workplace and you might solve that grievance and that is excellent that's a great outcome for that individual person but quite often the process ends there and there isn't an attempt necessarily to build a narrative about why that grievance occurred that tells that individual person that it's not just a kind of um, bad situation that's to do with them or their individual boss or their workplace. It's actually a feature of kind of work under capitalism and that the way to fight back against that is collective and as part of a union and, you know, create kind of a narrative there, a bit of political education, a bit of kind of, um, as Henry referred to, sort of building new trade unionists. And so the example that that I was going to reference was... um, Unite Hospitality, which is an offshoot of Unite, you know, obviously kind of one of the hugest, oldest unions in the UK. But Unite Hospitality being its own specific kind of offshoot of that that deals with hospitality workers. And they have embraced a kind of organising model where they've been going into workplaces that haven't really had any relationship to unions in the past. And they've been saying to young people, all those things that I've just mentioned, you know, it's not an individual um, issue. It's not a bug. It's a feature. And they do things on the ground that are kind of very quick, practical fixes where they'll say to a person, you know, we're going to um, overlook our usual regulation that you have to be a member for however many months before we'll help you. We will overlook that and we'll help you immediately. But your side of the bargain is to speak to your colleagues and to make, you know, five people join the union. That's very basic bread and butter kind of organizing um, tactics. In a lot of corners of the union movement, we've actually moved away from doing that. Um, so I think what they do is is very instructive and they've had loads of successes among this workforce that is precarious and is younger and is kind of more diverse in terms of race and gender and um, you know migration status and all of these things. They've been successful in not just organizing and winning, but in attracting a new generation of unionists. And they've done that within the the kind of traditional structures of um, of a very old and very big union. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that just kind of triggered for me one thing in the chapter on union democracy, which you mentioned. When you're talking about some of the barriers to participation that particularly seem to affect young workers and some of the ways of potentially overcoming these issues, like I think you talk about the idea of like a union passport. You know, if people are moving from job to job, you know, they might not have the time to sort of join the correct union for that workplace. And so, you know, having some sort of, you know, using actually kind of new technologies to overcome some barriers to participation uh, in innovative ways. I thought I thought that chapter was really interesting. I think big unions need to understand that we live in, in a different times. I mean, there's new times, there's new ways of employers taking advantage of workers, especially like as we were talking in terms of the gig economy, in terms of outsourcing. Things are changing and, and there is a need for big unions to understand that there is need to be a different strategy. Uh, there is small unions like us who are fighting different struggle uh, to them, maybe. But I think big unions need to have more... They need to do more work in terms of, you know, providing resources to campaigns, to organizing, but also working in partnership with other organizations and unions. If, if they cannot organize uh, those workers, we see in examples in universities where we got, where we, we got to organize workers, especially like cleaners, you know, security guards, workers, catering, workers who are like underpaid in worse condition, bad treatment. They never look up at these workers uh, before we go there. But once we go there, they suddenly they say that they are their members, but they are not their members. They just don't care about these workers, and suddenly they decide to care about those workers. We've seen those examples in many universities that we have want to organize, and we have had successful campaigns. And I think um, by working in partnership, I mean, we see uh, there was a motion of a boycott by UCU 
when IWGB was organizing University of London workers uh, fighting for an uh, inner house campaign. And USU managed to pass that motion to boycott Senate House. And that's the reason there was a lot of pressure on the university to bring the workers in house. And in fact, that was one of the, the, the reasons they brought the workers in house apart from the campaign that we were running. So it was very good that we have that support from UCU. We have seen examples of uh, United Voice of All the World where they are working with PCS uh, at the Ministry of Justice because PCS they have realized they can organize the workers who are outsourced, but UBW is very good at that. So they have worked in partnership, but now, you know, they, this has been working very well for them in terms of going to strike and all that. And, and I think, yeah, there should be more support from small unions, not necessarily with resources, but at least with, with support, like, you know, having political support for the, the unions that at the, at the end of the day, we are doing the same work, like, you know, fighting employers, trying to improve the conditions for workers and improve the rights for workers across the country as well. Mm. Well, let's talk a bit about community organising then. Yeah, Eve, in your book, you talk about ACORN, which is a, a really interesting model of a union that's kind of based in the community and organising on community issues. I suppose it's acknowledging that, you know, workers exist outside the workplace and there are other spaces in which to organise working class solidarity. So, yeah, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about ACORN or some similar examples um, of this kind of community organising and what makes them distinctive and successful where they have been successful. Yeah, I think the chapter where I kind of talk about these other types of unions actually follows on from what Henry was saying there about this kind of um, need to build alliances and solidarity within the union movement and within different unions as well. And so what I'm not calling for is for, you know, trade unions to suddenly start trying to be experts on um, renting issues or benefits or community kind of issues that ACORN campaign on, but rather for um, those different types of unions to have really strong relationships with each other and to be able to provide a kind of holistic experience, I guess, for a young person for whom the, the sorts of issues that are facing them are all really big and existential. So it's not just about work, it's about climate change and it's about, you know, being able to afford um, your own home. And before you even get there, it's about being able to find somewhere to live where your landlord can't just kick you out next week with no prior notice and where they, you know, you're not just living in a kind of mouldy, rat-infested home like a lot of young people are in the, the private rented sector. So those are the kinds of issues that are facing young people even before you start talking about um, their workplaces. So... For me, it's about looking at how union models can be used and can be really successful on those other issues as well and how they can connect with existing trade unions um, to really serve the needs of that that kind of younger generation. So ACORN is a really good example of, as you say, a community union that sort of started in Bristol but is now active all over the UK and campaign and organise successfully on, you know, everything from kind of housing and renters issues but also benefits and childcare and issues of that type. Um, I think another really good example um, is in tenants organising. So in Scotland where I'm based there's a very well-known tenants union called Living Rent which operates across the whole of Scotland Um, and what I think is interesting about them and, and which I cover in the book is that they began as a campaign so their model that they used was a campaigning model and they made a purposeful decision at one point in their evolution to change that structure and to become a union instead of a campaigning organization and what that was about was the recognition that they didn't just want to be doing that sort of firefighting that I referred to in the previous answer they wanted to be building power amongst ordinary people you know amongst ordinary renters in Scotland and and what they were finding was that while they were being pretty successful in their in their campaigning they had the same kind of leaders um, you know rushing around the country to get to every single um, process protest um, and, and they were people with the kind of political and cultural capital at the, the top of the union and instead what they decided to do was embrace this union model an organizing model rather than simply a campaigning one that that really um, kind of borrowed the structures of trade unionism and allowed that power to be built at the kind of grassroots level um, and that's been really successful for them you know they've kind of created more branches they've grown their membership they've continued to win on these different issues um, but without it just being these kind of figureheads always um, burning themselves out trying to win stuff and so I think that's a really good example but um, you know there are plenty I could point to around the country and as I say they have grown in number and in strength in contrast to the the kind of declining trade union membership numbers so I think there is plenty to to learn from those models. 
Yeah, I'd like to make three points, really. Um, The first one is, as Eve pointed to, is there are some very good examples of community unionism. For example, I did a lot of research um, around Polish workers, particularly, and other workers from Eastern Europe coming after 2004. And more community-type tactics where unions organised legal help, help with housing, certainly helped attract workers towards trade unions to joining and becoming active. A more current example that I included in the book was in Sheffield. There's a campaign called Sheffield Needs a Pay Rise. And it's a cross-union campaign where they've managed to find the money, mainly through the Bakers Union and the Trades Council, to employ a young organiser. And again, that's been really successful in recruiting workers. And even during the pandemic, they managed to win back pay that they were owed from um, pizza chains. So that's the first point. Um, I think there are very successful examples. The second one is... I think that the question of politics in trade unions is absolutely key. I don't accept this division about trade unions doing bread and butter issues and leaving the politics to the Labour Party. And we've seen how that was very much rejected, for example, in the Unite election with Sharon Graham, where workers voted for organising in the workplace. Now, for example, um, unions cannot stand on the sidelines of racism. If they do that, we have a divided working class. It opens up space for populists and for what we saw in 2008, where unions stood on picket lines with signs saying British jobs for British workers. So politics absolutely has to be part and parcel of what unions do. The third point is a more cautionary comment, which is that I would say that there's no hard and fast definition of what we mean by community unionism. And how far it's successful depends on whether it supports unions who take action in the workplace, because that's where things can be won, or whether it's a substitute And in the book, I wondered whether to include it, and I decided to go ahead. But I took the example of Sports Direct, and I did lots of interviews with people in the community. They were the worst employer in Britain in terms of making workers queue to be certs, sexual harassment, precarious contracts. And Community Unite, which had some excellent militants and community workers, mounted protests and demonstrations, very imaginative, along with one or two of the people in the Unite bureaucracy. But because they never managed to recruit a critical mass of workers in the factory or the warehouse, and they never took any action, then I'm afraid very little was won And in some ways, all those conditions of severe exploitation still exist, albeit in a different form. So my point is that community unionism can attract workers but in terms of winning in the workplace. It has to be supporting workers, not substituting for them. Hmm. Absolutely. It's it's a very good point. Um, I suppose following on from one of the things you just mentioned there, Jane, about race and diversity you know even your book you talk about a a liberatory unionism as something that the movement should be striving for and I suppose within that one of the parameters there is a proper meaningful engagement with a more diverse base so what what would a liberatory unionism encompass uh, in terms of the positions the internal structures uh, the, the actions that a union would take under this umbrella I think it's a good question because I do think that that chapter in the book, I felt it was absolutely vital to kind of make that argument, but it is also one of the most, I think, challenging in some senses um, argument that I make in the book, because it, what I am calling for is essentially a drastic reorganization of, you know, large parts of the union movement um, around a different set of principles, I suppose. So 
um, yeah, so the way I came to kind of talk about what I what I term liberatory unionism is um, because I felt like talking about equality and diversity just wasn't enough anymore. That's that's how we quite often talk about these issues in the union movement and actually in the mainstream more broadly. I think, um, and you know, that's that's well meaning. Um, it's a it's a start at addressing the the kinds of things we're talking about, where the working class that we serve is, you know, increasingly diverse. Or not even increasingly, actually, has always been has always been very diverse. Um, but you know, the, the the working class of today is a is a very kind of um, diverse one of different genders and people from different countries and different ethnicities and all of these different factors. Um, but at the moment, our unions, for the most part, and you know, it's a, a generalization, but um, a lot of what they do is equality and diversity. So it's, you know, having positions for, you know, women's officers, disabled um, workers officers, it's maybe having a fringe event at a conference about what the disabled workers committee want to see happen. Um, and, and those things are good. I'm not saying that they're negative things. Um, those people do great jobs and those, those kinds of events come up with great conversations and great solutions and they have they have made big differences um within the union movement and within workplaces and within society at large but when I talk about a liberatory unionism I'm talking about one that kind of structurally embraces the the needs of those workers in a way that is not just symbolic so it's kind of organized around those needs and the recognition that as Jane alluded to there quite often some people on the left will say that to care about these issues, to care about gender or race or migration, it is to divide the working class. When actually what I would say is, as Jane's just mentioned, it's those kind of issues that divide the working class already. So what we have to be doing is fighting against racism and against misogyny and against um, you know, anti-immigrant sentiment. And recognising from a trade union point of view that our experience of work and our experience of class cannot be separated from our experience as women as migrants as you know trans people in the workplace and um, all of those things are inextricably linked to each other and I'm going to have a very different experience in the workplace than a black woman is you know than a disabled man is for instance um, and, and what I want is a, a trade unionism that recognizes that and starts to grapple with it in a, a structural sense so you know some I think some of the good examples of this come from the states actually mainly because of the relationship in the states between union membership and healthcare. So what we see there is trade union membership in the states entitles you to healthcare. And so quite a lot of the kind of collective bargaining that we see happening in the states has had to account for how healthcare access has different kind of requirements for different people, um, specifically in the LGBT community. So if you're a trans person, you're going to need different kind of healthcare services than a cis person and so collective bargaining in the US and in some um, workplaces has evolved to include things like um, healthcare agreements that include medical transition for instance um, so that, that's that's a kind of solid example I think just because of that relationship between healthcare access and union membership in the states but there are lots of different ways that this could look and certainly some of the things that Henry's kind of talked about the IWGB doing um, and the examples that Jane's given of kind of care workers and women and workers being at the centre of organising. I think all of these things are, are really good examples of kind of how um, how a liberatory unionism might look. But yeah, it's a it's a big question because um, I recognise that what I'm calling for is a, a structural change um, rather than just a kind of easy tick box exercise. But that's the scale of what I think is required to start to um, meet some of those needs. Yeah, uh, what came through from the disputes that I looked at, particularly of women, is that they said that what they won was, in a material sense, life-changing, the equal pay, defending their jobs, and at the government department, again, winning better working conditions. And it was also transforming for them personally, that they realised that they weren't powerless, that they could do things, they went round the country speaking, and it gave them an incredible confidence. Now, what the question that raises is that most unions on paper have very good policies now. My union, which was the UCU, had excellent policies on paper. So the question is, how can we take action and win to not only defend things that are being taken away, but to win better wages? So I would pose the question slightly differently, although they're interrelated, is what sort of action can win? 
And my experience of being on the executive and a long-time member is only too often defeat was snatched from the jaws of victory, that a one-day strike was seen as enough to get back to the negotiating table, and that what unions need to do is to take determined action that is going to win, that is going to bring employers to their knees and to make sure that those workers have got their well-deserved victory. And of course, that is in turn linked to having democratic control of disputes so that they are not in the hands of the bureaucracy and officials. Um, I have a whole chapter in this on the book on how we approach some of the sort of questions that Eve talked about. And there have been periods in our history where, if you like, rank and file workers have completely set the tempo and scale of disputes. In the 1970s, it was workers, building workers, dockers, that actually overtook, if you like, the union machinery to come out on the streets, to pull the union machinery behind them and to get the whole government to back down. So I think that structural questions are related to bigger questions about real democratic control in the union and of union disputes and what sort of action is actually going to win rather than simply be tokenistic. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jane. We're running close to the end of our time, so I have two or three things I'd like to touch on, if that's okay. One is, I suppose, the fact that we're seeing currently in the pandemic and in the wake of Brexit as well, there's been this sort of unprecedented sort of labour shortage in the country, right? I think, Jane, you cite a figure of something like 1.3 million foreign-born workers have left the country last year in 2020. And that's got a particular significance in certain sectors of the economy, um, you know, hospitality, manufacturing and retail. I was wondering, and this is to, to everyone, you know, what the implications of this in terms of building workers' power, does this give workers more leverage potentially to make demands? Yeah, I I just want to say uh, that um, during the pandemic, there's loads of workers who have been so badly treated by their employers that, uh, you know, one of the reasons they have left is because of that. Like, uh, they have left because they haven't been treated properly, uh, despite, you know, being key workers even like some of them that even have been working during the pandemic, have been badly treated. And I think uh, because of Brexit and uh, the pandemic as well, the situation has deteriorated for many of these, uh, especially precarious workers, because uh, many of employers have taken advantage of the pandemic to take away uh, working conditions that they had. In many workplaces, they have done uh, redundancies where it wasn't even needed. And at the moment, like many of those places, they don't want to bring workers back, but they still want to keep the, the jobs there still. But they want to give the work to the people who remain there. And it's, it's, it's really bad because they overwork in these workers. And um, because of this situation, uh, our union has grown uh, during the pandemic. And one of the reasons uh, has been because uh, many of the workers have realized that they have to be in a union in order to get support, in order to really get, get help. Uh, and that's was that's something that we've been doing, like helping lots of workers even to recover money for 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 law. We still, like just a couple of weeks ago, we we have a demonstration uh, in a hotel because some cleaners weren't paid like five months of wages. And as a result of the demonstration, we managed to secure the the wages being paid the next day. So there are things like that that are happening, and uh, I think uh, this is a good time to organize workers because, as I said, all of them have been badly treated, but also uh, their conditions have been taken away by them and even in some cases have been worsened, like some employers have changed the contracts of employment, redundancies in workplaces where they used to be, let's say, 20 workers, now there's 10 workers. And even in the other industries like couriers, uh, where they still, despite being doing a good job during the pandemic, we are in the situation that uh, some companies like, we have a case now against Ocado, for example, where where couriers were working during this pandemic, during the pandemic, helping the company make millions in profits, and now that the pandemic is is not as bad as it was, those workers have been basically uh, sucked from their jobs because they were demanding better working conditions and they were demanding better contracts of employment, and that is a campaign that we're fighting. So 
this is one of the big problems, and I think uh, it is happening all across uh, the country with different jobs. And that's something that uh, we need to take advantage of and start to organize those workplaces in order to get back the conditions that they've been taken away, but also the way they've been treated. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Henry. We live in um, interesting times, as they say, and there are dangers and there are opportunities. And as Henry said, some employers have gone on the offensive and gone for this tactic of fire and then rehire on worse terms and conditions. We saw it with big firms like British Gas, like British Airways, And more recently, I think Weetabix and Clark Shoes have done exactly the same thing, tried to re-employ workers on worse terms and conditions, and they have gone on strike and got a lot of support from their communities. But there are also opportunities as well, aren't there, in that there are very severe labour shortages, and this does give workers the chance to organise in their current unions or to join unions and to start to make demands about their health and safety, about their working conditions and about their pay. And I think there's also a lot of incredibly pent up anger from national health workers who have been absolutely on the front line during the pandemic, are on their knees and are looking to demand the sort of wages that they deserve. Because after all, we've seen who the important people are in society, lorry drivers, nurses, doctors, not investment bankers. So I think we should prepare for a winter when lots of things are going to be happening and really looking, as Henry and Eve have said, for what we can do on the ground to be part of that organising and part of making sure that workers win. Well, a big thank you to Eve Livingston, Jane Hardy and Henry Chango Lopez for joining us today on Radicals in Conversation. If you're enjoying the discussion, you want to keep listening, then the unabridged version of this and other episodes of the podcast are available to Patreon members. You just need to head over to patreon.com forward slash Pluto Press to find out more. Eve's book, Make Bosses Pay, and Jane's book, Nothing to Lose But Our Chains, are both 50% off on plutobooks.com. Just use the coupon podcast at the checkout. And if you want to find out more about the amazing work that the IWGB is doing, then head over to iwgb.org.uk. We'll be back next month with another episode of Radicals in Conversation. So until then, thanks for listening and goodbye. Goodbye.